The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study seen in Star Wars. I'm one of your co-hosts, Melissa Miller. I'm a science writer and also contribute to Star Wars Insider Magazine. And I'm your other co-host, James Floyd. I also write for Star Wars Insider Magazine. This episode, Star Wars Ologies is going to talk about blue food science as represented in Star Wars by Luke's Blue Milk, of course, but also blue noodles seen in Andor and all kinds of blue foods from Galaxy's Edge. Our guest expert today is Dr. Chang Chi Liu, who is an associate professor at the School of Exercise and Nutritional Sciences at San Diego State University. Hi, Chang Chi. Hi, James. Hi, Melissa. I'm glad to join you to talk about this interesting topic. Yeah, well, I'm really excited for you to be here. And I sent James a picture of it, but I, you know, got in the spirit this morning by adding blue food dye to my breakfast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm ready. Well, can you tell us what nutritional and food sciences is? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I would say these are actually two different uh, subject areas. Sometimes people confuse one with another. I would like to think food science is what covers everything from harvest to consumption. Uh, so like the composition of the food, its preservation, processing, quality, and safety. Well, nutrition kind of studies how these food interact with our body after consumption, right? Like their digestion, uh, nutrient absorption, the metabolism, and how they affect our uh, health. So you can see it's uh, they are kind of uh, connected, but uh, distinct disciplines. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it makes sense that they would be, you know, connected then, I guess, with the exercise also at the school at USC, right yeah at SCSU so yeah I'm trained as a food scientist but I do collaborate with uh, nutrition uh, scientists as well uh, in the school sometimes I like to joke that my study area is uh, from farm to poop because I I, I do study some like uh, food production like uh, hydroponics and stuff and uh, obviously I'm a food scientist but then I also collaborate with them like studying microbiomes where we analyze the stool mm -hmm. samples. So right. all the way, yeah. The yeah. full process. Yeah, I full say, process. Yeah, farm to fecal is not one I've heard before. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm excited to get into it. What's your relationship to Star Wars? Is it something you saw a lot uh, growing up? Yeah, like uh, I'm definitely a fan of Star Wars. Yeah, in China, I guess it may not be as popular as here, but I remember when I grew up, I did see... A thing that uh, really stuck in my mind is, I don't know if it's called a battleship or something, that camel-like thing that can walk, that giant. Mm -hmm. Oh, the walker? Yeah, yeah, the walker, yeah. Uh, for some reason, yeah, it just stuck with me. And uh, then when I grew up, I watched everything, uh, all the movies and also now the TV shows as well. I even got my, my son into it. <laughs> and uh, his favorite character is actually Darth Vader. <laughs> And uh, last Halloween, he dressed as him, like with the helmet, the jacket, cloak, and the lightsaber, everything. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's always good to raise a, a future Sith Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into blue food. Is blue as a, a pigment naturally occurring on Earth? Yeah, I think it is kind of rare in nature. There are definitely blue food, but it's not nearly as common as uh, other colored food. Some food are commonly referred to as blue, like blueberries and uh, blue corns. Uh, but if you look closely, for example, for blueberries, uh, it's actually a kind of deep purplish color. Uh, especially if you process into a jam, you will see that the color is definitely not blue, but uh, purplish. Uh, so the major pigments that are responsible for the color of uh, blueberries are like anthocyanins. Uh, it, it's a mixture of different types of uh, anthocyanins, but the major ones in blueberry are malvidine-based uh, anthocyanins, which has a purplish color, right? And uh, also for blue corn, it's very similar. Uh, so the pigment that is responsible for its color are anthocyanins, uh, and the, it's really have a purple color. I don't know why they are called blue corns. But if you process them into tortilla, you actually get a color closer to blue, uh, that that is because it will undergo the nitrogenization process, which is you steep the corn kernels in lime water, which is a very alkaline condition, and that will change the color of the pigment into blue. 
That's one interesting property of anthocyanin. That is that its color changes at different pHs. Uh, usually mm-hmm. under acidic pH, it's red in color. At neutral, it's purple, and then blue at the alkaline pH. Wow, that's really cool. So you could use those you know, like with chips and depending on what the pH is of, of how you kind of steep them, you could use the same thing, but get three different colors. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, so I think another like example would be like the blue butterfly pea flower. That mm-hmm. one is really a true blue, but the it's the same. It's uh, the pigment is actually anthocyanin. But that one is based on a uh, anthocyanidine called uh, delphinidine, which has a more blue color. But again, the color will not be very pH stable. So you probably cannot make it into a blue lemonade because once there's acid in there, it will turn into a reddish color rather than a blue color. But maybe you can show the color change process and that will be interesting to customers. That would be that that is like an instant science experiment. It's like, hey, yeah. I got this blue liquid I'm pouring in, and boom, red lemonade. <laughs> yeah. People actually use the extract, uh, for example, from red cabbage as a pH indicator. Like it will show you, uh, it really has covers pretty much the whole spectrum, like uh, when the pH changes. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I'm remembering now that there's like a gin that changes color when you add tonic to it. Like it's okay. purple Play in the it's bottle. Likely- yeah, yeah so I'm wondering if it's a yeah. similar science. So, ethylcyanine? Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. a very common pigment. Like a lot of flowers and uh, like fruits, the color from ethylcyanine. So like strawberry, like all the reddish, purplish colored flowers, the color is likely from ethylcyanine. Yeah. That's yeah. really crazy to think about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I sort of assume that the reason they use blue in Star Wars and in plenty of other things is because it does seem alien to us, you know, because there's so little of it here. But if they did color changing ones, like that's the next step, you know, color changing drinks and noodles and stuff like that. As soon as you stir, you know, it in the broth or something like that, that would really, I think, wow people. Right. And and there are also some foods like uh, when it's raw, it's blue. But uh, after it's cooked, the color will change. One example is there are like blue lobsters. Uh, it's mm-hmm. more rare than the regular lobster, but there are. And also blue uh, crayfishes. Their blue color comes from a protein called uh, crustacyanin. So that protein can bind with a carotenoid called astaxanthin. It's very interesting. The astaxanthin itself have a red orangish color. Mm-hmm. But once it binds with that protein, the color changes to blue. But when you cook the lobster, once the protein is denatured, the astaxanthin will become red-orange again. That's why the color changes when you cook the lobster, right? It turns red. I would say another example is the horseshoe crab. Uh, It's probably not very common. It's not consumed here, but in some regions like Thailand, it's consumed as a food. And its blood is blue color due to another protein called uh, hemocyanin. It functions similarly to the hemoglobin in our blood, but instead of having a red color, it's blue. But again, it's a protein, so it's not very heat stable. Once it is denatured during the cooking process, it loses its color. So you won't see it in cooked horseshoe crab. You know, talking about about how we consider blue as kind of an alien thing, how does the color of food affect our way of processing, you know, its taste and why we would choose it or not choose it? Yeah, color definitely have a great impact of how we perceive the flavor and our overall food choices. Uh, I mean, it's the first cue our brain uses to kind of uh, tell us what the food might taste like, right? So uh, we have already established a connection between color and the flavor of the food, and we often use it as a quality indicator of food. Uh, For example, when you look at a green banana, our brain will know that uh, it's unripe, it probably doesn't taste sweet, and it will have that astringent taste. But when you see a yellow banana, it will be something completely different. It will be sweet uh, with a ripe banana flavor. So it definitely have a, a effect on our perception of the flavor. And uh, there's one interesting study uh, where they try to trick the wine tasters by presenting them with a white wine and a, an identical white wine, but with a red currant added to make it look like a red wine. So, and these are professional wine tasters. But once when they taste that same white wine with the food current, they start to use a lot of descriptors that are typically associated with red wine, like 
chicory, chocolate kind of flavors. It's not like they are lying, but their brains are kind of tricked by the color. So you start to have these uh, imaginary <laughs> flavors. Oh, that's so, so what, what happens if they're blindfolded and, and try them? Uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. In sensory science, sometimes we try to blindfold them or in our sensory rooms, we have different uh, colored lights that can kind of mask certain colors. Yeah, uh, if color is very important or if you don't want color to influence people's uh, perception of the food, usually that's when we use the lighting or blindfold to avoid uh, introducing the bias. Well, and that also makes me think of, you know, colorblind people too, because I yeah. remember growing up, we went blueberry picking and my uncle is colorblind in that spectrum, right? Because unripe blueberries are green and then they're sort of a light blue and then they get, you know, the purplish blue. And he had to do the whole thing by touch. Like he had to touch every single blueberry. And oh, if it yeah. fell off, it was ripe because otherwise okay. they all looked kind of the huh. same to him. Yeah, yeah they probably established like some other connections with the color that they perceive. Yeah. Right. Or just doing it by touch, right? You would know an right, unripe right. Yeah, banana yeah. when you peeled it versus a ripe one or something okay. like that. So now I'm wondering if like chimpanzees and other monkeys can also have this sense that oh hey a yellow banana is ripe yeah i think that's also yes in, in, interesting because uh i think animals definitely have their uh, favorite colors actually like uh, primates are kind of uh, attracted to orange colored things as well as other colorful fruit and also the pigment one major biological importance of these pigments why plants invest energy and the nutrient to synthesize them is one of the things is to attract either pollinators or like uh, seed dispersers, right? So it can help carry their seeds far away to plant uh, their next generation. So yeah, and there are like different animals have different preferences. Like I think the birds and the monkeys, they are attracted to multicolored things. Some animals doesn't care, like elephant uh, only cares about size of their food and not really the color, but Definitely, I think humans are visual animals. Like we, we like to have more colorful food. So what is the blue food dye? Like the blue food dye that I put in my noodles this morning, do you know what that is made out of then? It's I mean, I just probably did... either blue dye number one or number two. These are the two that are approved by FDA to be used in food. I think in Europe, there's another one. So blue dye number one is uh, brilliant blue and blue dye number two is uh, what we call indigo carmine. So that one is actually from a natural source, which is from a plant, the leaves. That's what we used to make indigo. And uh, it's not that commonly used in food. It's more used in textile, like our jeans. That one mm. we use it to dye the jeans. But I mean, uh, once you process into the dye, then it's more commonly used in like food. Like that mm -hmm. is our uh, blue number two. It could be what you use this morning. <laughs> so well, what about blue number one? I'm assuming that was the first one to get approved. But is, uh, is that natural or synthetic? No, that's uh, chemically synthesized. Even for in indigo, uh, I don't think people still use a plant to extract. Uh, rather, they use chemical synthesis to produce. Yeah. So the leaf of the plant itself doesn't look blue. You also have to go through a fermentation process. That's when uh, the pigment will be produced. I think it's much easier to use uh, chemical synthesis to produce that dye. Yeah. Now I'm wondering about like the process, how they discovered that it would turn blue. They're just like, right. <laughs> we got these leaves here. Let's, I guess they, they, if they naturally fermented or something and they're like, dude, dude. that's cool. It's blue. <laughs> Let's dip stuff in it. Huh? What about blue cheese? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Blue cheese, that color comes from the mold, right? The, the penicillium uh, that grew uh, in the cheese. Uh, personally, I don't like it because I don't like the strong flavor of blue cheese. Me either. <laughs> uh, and I would say it's more like a dark greenish. I mean, a little bit of a bluish depending on the variety of the cheese and the, what kind of string they use uh, to produce. That color actually comes from melanin. It's kind of a strange because we usually think of melanin as a brownish, blackish color, right? Think of how we get tanned. That's because we our skin starts to synthesize melanin. Uh, and also our iris, the iris of our eyes, the pigmentation comes from melanin. And also our hair, uh, right? Like uh, depending on how much melanin and what type of melanin you have, uh, you can have uh, black hair, red hair, brown hair, blonde. But in, interestingly, the, the melanin from the mold have a green, bluish color. <laughs> That's 
crazy that it's the same melanin that's you know determines our our skin and hair and eye color. I guess it's but... a group of chemicals. Okay, they have different uh, structures and the degree of uh, polymerization, and that would determine what color it will have. Well, now I'm wondering if if we can add you know what other polymers or something that might bind to it to change the color. We could yeah change yeah. our color of our skin. Yeah, you, or you can design a specific color right using melanin. Interesting. Whoa. So when you're watching Star Wars, I, if you watched Andor, did you like notice the blue noodles and start to think about how that would work? Or do you just, uh, you know, enjoy Star Wars for what it is? Yeah, to be honest, I didn't really notice and like the blue noodles. I probably at that scene, I definitely noticed. I mean, it's a bright blue color. Right. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. James has got yeah. the recipe book for it. Maybe I should um, pay more attention since I'm a food scientist. But yeah, I, I would say I'm more attracted to the aliens, <laughs> the robots, the, you know, spaceship, lightsaber, those kind of stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because they don't really, I mean, I assume in that recipe, you know, you add blue food dye at some point or well, do you this actually. This one is a uh, Gourmanda's Glow Blue Noodles from the Galaxy's Edge cookbook. And it uh-huh. uses the blue butterfly PT. Okay for its blue coloring, uh, I think they, they try to use as natural as possible, but it, it gets that kind of bright blue. How do they, uh, I guess it's a type of tea? It, it's a type of pea. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a real tea since it's not made of uh, tea leaves. What people do is kind of like how you make a tea, just to immerse the flower from the butterfly pea, which has a, a deep blue color into just hot water and then the water will turn blue and then you can just uh, use it to dye your noodles or whatever you want to uh, color as blue. Yeah, it does have a kind of a bright <laughs> blue color. Yeah. Again, like uh, most of the natural pigment w- is not that stable through the cooking process. You probably lose some blue color. It will become a little dullish. Uh, if you use like those synthetic dyes, blue one or blue two, you will have probably a very bright blue color. And so, yeah, you could add that to your milk to have it be blue milk. Is the implication for that, James, that it's bantha milk? Yeah, that uh, blue milk, uh, like you see Luke drinking, is bantha milk. I don't know who gets close enough to milk a bantha. There's all that fur. (laughs) I mean, Uh, the sand people, like, they ride bantha. Yeah. Yeah, they they have that relationship with them. They can get get down in there and milk them. There's also the Bantha Chai recipe uh, in the Galaxy's Edge book. And again, that uses the uh, blue butterfly pea for its coloring. Yeah, I wonder what it would mean. I mean, I don't know if there are different colors of milk here on Earth uh, from different mammals or something like that. You, I sort of you actually just... see a little differences, uh, mostly depending on how much fat content you got in there. So if you see the skimmed milk, it actually has a little bit of a blue hue to it. Not, not too much, but if you compare it to a full fat. The fat globules get dispersed when they make a homogenized milk. Those little droplets will scatter light, and that makes everything looks white. But when you don't have that fat, it's kind of like when you see the deep ocean, like they scatter the light, but the short wavelength light, like blue light, doesn't get scattered as much. So that's why we see them having a little bit of a blue color. Wow, because I'd noticed that before, but I never, like, decided, oh, wow, that really is blue. And I thought it was, you know, kind of just a trick, but it's really the wavelengths of light bouncing right. back. Yeah. So maybe banthas, would it have any effect on it, their diet? Like if something they're eating, would that turn milk blue or is that Could not be. Really Yeah, because uh, uh, actually even on earth, like depending on what the, the cow was eating, if they eat just green grass, like grass fed, because they have a lot of carotenoids in the grass and those can be accumulated in the milk. So you will have a more yellowish orange color milk as compared to if they are green fed when they don't have much of those carotenoids. And that will especially make a huge difference when you isolate that fat to make butter. If they are green fed, the butter will really have a pale color. That's when they actually add colorants to make it uh, yellower. Yeah. Okay. So I would imagine, yeah, for bands, it would be the same thing. If they eat something blue, maybe it gets accumulated in their milk. Right. Wow. So yeah. you could have a nice blue butter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you need to have a fat soluble blue dye, yeah, to <laughs> to achieve yeah. that. Yeah. Well, back in an early episode, uh, we talked about distilling and spirits and brewing and stuff like that. And of course, there's like also the blue, almost really turquoise sort of alcohol, spotchka. Right that we see more and more uh, in Mandalorians. 
And I'm definitely curious about that because we blew alcohol here on earth, but I assume it's died. It's not any sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. died. Yeah. And I think for alcohol, I think that people are at least more acceptable for them to be blue <laughs> because, I mean, the blue color food, sometimes people will not readily accept them, except for some candies like uh, MMs, like they do use the synthetic dyes. But but yeah, for alcohols, there have been some like blue colored alcohols. Yeah, I was really disappointed to learn this that uh, Bombay Sapphire Gin that looks blue in the bottles, it's clear and it's just the bottle oh. color blue. I was really <laughs> disappointed to learn that for some reason. If you have a gin and tonic, it will glow under UV light, so it'll look purple, right? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, James, you have in the notes here that. It's the krill that make the spotchka? Is that yeah, the thing? The, okay. Yeah, the, the blue krill. I mean, we were talking about the blue crawfish and blue lobsters. So why not have blue krill, you know, tiny shrimp that they were farming on that one planet in Mandalorian and they use that to make blue spotchka? Because I guess, you know, you're not changing the pH of it because you're not cooking it or denaturing the proteins. Yeah, well, and I, I guess in general, maybe that's a question going back to more of our distilling process. But the idea that krill is somehow used to make an alcohol just it like seems very odd to me. Maybe that's a thing that exists in in real life, and I just don't know it. Yeah, not that I'm no <laughs> of. Yeah, I know there's be, some like yeah. green crab. You know, I think it's like vodka or something like that where they use invasive green crabs because they like pitched it as like oh we're saving the environment by using these crabs but it was also just it was clearly a gimmick so i i just didn't know that in star wars it's part of the story that i don't know if i would drink a crustacean based alcohol (laughs) right it'd just be very yeah savory salty i don't know now i think of it like some other predators of that creole might even accumulate more color because even on earth like the salmon, that the orange pinkish color comes from creole because they eat on the creoles. And also flamingo, like their feather, that uh, pink feather comes from creole. And also the pigment is the same thing that we talked about before. It's called astaxanthin, it's the carotenoids. But animals actually cannot synthesize carotenoids. Only plants, algae, maybe fungi can synthesize them. Uh, so they got their carotenoids from like uh, algae, which is the food for the creoles. Uh, so you can see like these colors can also get accumulated through the food yeah. chain. Yeah, that's another good spot for a science advisor on these Star Wars projects. Is if just in the background of that planet with the blue krill, there was like a blue flamingo, right. you know, yeah. like walking through <laughs> the, the pool. <laughs> Wow. But now I'm thinking we could make blue flamingos. I mean, that would be <laughs> yeah, sort of a, a weird abomination, but it would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. Please be careful when making blue flamingos. <laughs> right. And then that's the thing is I would certainly try alcohol made out of blue krill, but it definitely seems something, you know, the splash in general, I guess, seems more like you know, your sort of bathtub gin, you know, you're sort of, you know, this isn't a straight recipe. It's just, you know, desperate times, people sort of fermenting uh, and distilling whatever they can. So yeah, but how it gets to Tatooine, that's also a different expert, you know, that's more of a trade situation, I guess. Well, have you tried blue milk? I don't know if you've been to Galaxy's Edge, but they now have like Uh, a stand, right, where they have blue milk and green milk, I think. Yeah, I haven't got a chance, but since I have a four-year-old, I guess I will go someday and I will definitely try them. Now I know yeah. that they are. <laughs> yeah, I'm picturing your little Darth Vader, you know, like right, drinking yeah. his. <laughs> so have you both tried those food, blue food? I've had the green milk, I think. I've heard that the green okay. milk tastes better. So I, I tried the green okay. milk, but I can't <laughs> remember at all what it tasted like probably change anything because those dyes are usually tasteless but again if it tricks your brain maybe you will taste something different it, but... it, it's not milk it's a more of a fruit blend oh, uh, so, I yeah it's not actual milk it, you know because <laughs> people would be like i paid six dollars for a cup of milk <laughs> well and that's why i've never tried it so this is good to know i've never tried it because i'm like i'm walking around galaxy you know disneyland all day like the last time i drank a glass of milk i was you know 12 years old or something like that i was like i don't want a glass of milk it's 90 degrees out so i've just never bought one because i actually thought it was milk yeah i mean they can make it into a shake or smoothie right. so they actually can also use a natural dye which is another one 
that is getting popular. It's also a protein called the phycocyanin, which is isolated from uh, spirulina, uh, a cyanobacteria. Mm-hmm. And so if you just look at the uh, spirulina, there are supplements made of spirulina. They don't look blue. They just look uh, dark greenish color. So you really have to isolate the protein from the biomass. But once you do that, it has a really bright blue color. But again, it's a protein so if you heat it to 50 degrees Celsius or above, it will start to fade that color. But it's, it, will, it will be great to be served in like uh, cold drinks, like a smoothie, yogurt, or milkshake. I thought wow. spirulina was a type of pasta. I thought it was a kelp. <laughs> it is a, we used to call it an algae, but it's really mm-hmm. a cyanobacteria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, algae is a very loose term. It includes, you know, like the seaweed, yeah. the microalgae, then some cyanobacteria. They kind of split that apart as they discovered they were really different. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess I know where I got my idea, but where you got pasta, I don't know. It's the little spiral sound. That, that It sounds like an Italian word. Spirulina. <laughs> Well, we definitely have to get into the blue raspberry of it all because, you know, James and I grew up in the U.S. And here, you know, every candy that's blue or Gatorade or those sorts of things, for the most part, it's raspberry flavored. I have to say, even as like an eight year old, I was like, what? There are no blue raspberries. Yeah, I think like thing when they first introduce, they kind of uh, already there are so many flavors that are associated with the red color, like cherry, strawberry, watermelon, right? So it will be kind of uh, boring to use red again for raspberry. And how how do you make it stand out? And I also read the article. I don't know if it's true or not. They said when they introduced the uh, raspberry flavor, there were some safety concerns of uh, synthetic dye red number two which is no longer allowed to be used in food by FDA. But that one has a kind of a dark red color and it used to be the choice for raspberry flavors. And now they need to find the replacement. Uh, but how they come up with blue, I have no idea. Well, I think that probably is to show that, hey, we're not using red dye number two because <laughs> it's very obviously blue. Um, yeah, I started to do a little research on this, uh, talking about why there's that connection between raspberry and blue. And it was kind of, you know, it lucked out at the same time as that red dye scare. Like it was ice pops and icy that started off with the the blue coloring equals raspberry and everyone else just kind of adopted it, uh, you know, candies and stuff. But it was it was a way to sell blue dye. Oh. <laughs> um, and so they're just like, let's make it new. And then, yeah, so it's it supposedly inspired by a blue raspberry, which I guess was called Rubus leucodermis, but it's completely artificial. Yeah, that, that it came out in, I think, 1969 or 1970. Yeah, and it was basically a way that really helped differentiate the colors for kids that are getting these otter pops and stuff. Yeah, and I think that kind of a different color also adds fun and novelty to the product. And also the bright color probably will be especially appealing to kids. <laughs> yeah. That's Plus you can say. make the whole rainbow that way now. That, right. That, yeah. you know, my, my, my son loves like when like popsicles can dye his tongue into different colors. <laughs> I, I don't like that, but right. he uh, <laughs> to show yeah. off his colorful tongues. Yeah. No, that's what I was going to say. As a kid whose favorite color was blue and who loved Otter Pops, I remember the blue raspberry. So it's interesting to me if that was sort of the early on version of it. And then it just sort of spread because, yeah, that way you could get, you know, the color you wanted. So yeah. if they're, if they're I've... marketing most of it to kids, you know, in these candies and things like that, it makes enough sense that you'd want to, yeah, cover the whole rainbow. Yeah, that definitely. I'm a fan of blue otter pops. Too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and then well, I think over time, then the consumers start to associate uh, the blue color with raspberry flavor. Right. Like I said earlier, like when they did the study, like the survey, they just present a, a blue color drink to subjects and ask them to guess what color it would be. Then in the UK and the US, raspberry was ranked the top answer. Like, but in some Asian countries like uh, China, it's going to be mint and uh, blueberry because they never associate raspberry with uh, the blue color. Right. Well, yeah. And if like we've talked about this whole time, there is not a lot of blue foods, then yeah, what would you assign to blue? You know, right. so it doesn't make sense to me to pull the raspberry out of it, but to pull something out of the red spectrum because there's already too many reds. Yeah and assign it to blue i'm just yeah that's really interesting to find out sort of yeah and i think it, also the same thing for mint right mint is not really blue in color but since mm-hmm. the mouthwash that we use is colored blue sometimes mm-hmm. and the 
that has a strong mint flavor. Maybe that's how people associate them together. That is true that, that we also use blue for mint. Um, or maybe it's be like... because of the cooling effect. And then the blue also gives you like icy kind of that was, uh, yeah, yeah. feeling. Yeah, like that you was... get those little mint candies that have the blue specks in them. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's what I was going to say is like, A, I associate mint with green, like pretty much exclusively. But then when you started talking about the blue, I was like, oh yeah, those flecks and in, in gum or mints or whatever. And yeah, I think it's more, I just say fresh, you know, blue is fresh, right. you yeah. know, and so it goes with mint. Well, yeah, blue raspberry though. It's, it's interesting that for you, if you grew up in China, that you didn't have that association. Let's talk about other really bright colors in food. You know, where do those colors come from? What dyes or what chemicals kind of go into to some of those? Like if we wanted a, a bright green or a bright orange. So like, obviously, the easiest way is to use the synthetic dyes. I mean, we have uh, blue number one, number two. We also have a few like, uh, there's a green number three, but it's rarely used. It's approved to use. But people, the food manufacturers just don't use green number three. When they want to come up with the green color, they just use a blue color mixed with a yellow color to get mm. the, the green color. So that actually, let me sort of another interesting example is, uh, you know, for amphibians like a frog, they often have a green color. But actually, they don't have a green pigment. Instead, they have a yellow pigment. And also their skin can reflect blue light. Uh, so the, the yellow plus the blue makes them look green. And in certain cases, when they lack that uh, yellow pigment, they will look blue, like the blue poison dart frog. Uh, so sometimes the color we see actually are not coming from the pigment alone. Uh, so actually the color, there are two major sources of color. One is chemical color, which is you have a chemical that selectively absorb light at different wavelengths. And then there are also structural colors. Structure colors are very common, for example, in like butterflies, fish, and uh, also bugs uh, and those kind of things. So blue as a chemical color is very rare in nature, but as a structure color, it's not that rare because there are blue jays, right? Like there's that uh, blue fish, like in Finding Nemo, that Dory oh, fish. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so those comes from like their scales and the feather have these microstructures that can scatter light at different wavelengths. Usually it's the longer wavelength light that gets scattered, but the blue light is short wavelength. So they get reflected to our eye. That's why they appear blue. In food, most of the color comes from the chemical color because the structure usually gets destroyed during the food processing. Uh, so you will lose that color. Yeah. And I remember hearing, I don't know if it's still true, but I remember hearing at some point that like, if you got a drink from Starbucks and it was a strawberry, that it was actually the dye they were using was like crushed up like Amazonian beetle wings or something like that. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I think the, they no longer use it. That comes from a bug, a scale an insect called a cochineal. So it's a carmine. Carmine is still used as a dye in food, like a U-plate use carmine to dye their strawberry flavored yogurt. So that actually doesn't come from strawberry, but from the bug. Right. Uh, yeah. No, I just remember that as being a really interesting opportunity for science communicators, you know, because there's so much that we eat. And I mean, I do it every day. There's so much that I eat that I don't know, you know, exactly the origins of it. But telling people if they got strawberry drinks at Starbucks, they were eating, you know, crushed up beetle wings. Strawberry drinks and yogurts, not vegetarian. Right. I mean, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. So. And I think even you play this looking for like a replacement because also the consumers, once they find out it's actually crushed bugs, they are not very happy. Well, <laughs> it actually took also, them a long time because I guess it's actually difficult to find a stable replacement that can also like recreate that uh, color. Right. But I guess here's my question. Strawberries are red. And so when you smush them up into yogurt, it makes pink. Like, why did we need to add? Is it just because we want that bright pink? Do you know, just the strawberry to yogurt ratio wasn't brilliant enough? And yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, the pigment from the strawberry is also anthocyanins. And the, those natural pigment, unfortunately, they are not very stable. So that pink color might fade away during the storage or the pasteurization process uh, of the yogurt. Mm -hmm. So you will lose that uh, pink color. And probably it's not going to be as strong 
as some of the other pigments that they choose. Would, would that also be because, you know, that the yogurt product tends to have less acidity than the, the strawberries themselves? So it would kind of turn to that clear because of, if it's more milk pH? I think the milk also, no, for yogurt, because they're also fermented. So they actually have a lot of lactic acid. So oh, I think okay. the pH should be low enough to make them stay red. But yeah, I think the stability is a main issue for uh, not using those natural pigments. Because of the consumer demand, the food manufacturers have been trying to switch to more natural alternatives uh, to dye these uh, different food. Now, that's interesting because, yeah, if you were to put strawberries into plain yogurt and eat it right there, I never considered that it would be a different color than if you were doing it during the mass cooking and yeah. producing and storage and all of that kind of stuff. So right. there you go. That's the answer. I think we were you know, talking about uh, you know, the red color coming from these scales that was a cochinia. Cochinia. Um, yeah. Cochinia, sorry. But uh, do we use pigments from uh, non-animal or plant sources? Like, do we use pigments from minerals in food? Because, you know, we have blue minerals like, you know, turquoise, lapis lazuli. Do those end up ground up and, and used as a dye for food? It used to be used, but now, so at, at least right now, like there's no uh, FDA approved mineral based uh, pigment. So uh, there are, but not blue. Uh, for example, the iron oxide basically is the, the rust, right? The color can range from like a yellowish to red to dark brown color. So those can be used in like hot candies, chewing gums, but it's very rare. There are also like titanium dioxide, uh, which is the white color. It's the same white color that you use to paint your wall, but uh, like sometimes you see the icings, uh, they add that. Uh, it's actually banned in Europe because of some safety concerns. And I think FDA is also reevaluating its safety, but right now it's still permitted to use in food as a whitening agent. But for blue, right now there's uh, no permitted mineral-based uh, pigment. But they used to use uh, ultramarine and the uh, Perusian blues uh, in candy making to make those uh, re very blue colored candies. I think ultramarine is still permitted to use in feed, in animal feed. I don't know why you need uh, blue colored animal feed, but yeah. Interesting. But in human food, no, there's no mineral-based pigment. I don't know. Maybe those cows are like, oh, this will taste like raspberry because it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> Only American and UK cows, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there any other stars, blue foods, James, that we should cover? I can't think of any. So if you're listening and you know of a blue food we missed, please let us know. Right. Yeah. So we need to add this as a Wikipedia entry, you know, blue right. foods <laughs> and how they originate. Tongchi, did you want to tell us how you got into this field? And if somebody was interested in going into food sciences, what path they should take? Okay, yeah. So I'm always interested. I'm kind of a foodie. So <laughs> I'm always interested in food. So I guess that's how I got into it. And also for my undergrad, I actually studied uh, food safety and quality because at that time in China, the food safety is a major issue. So I also want to uh, learn about uh, how to make our food uh, more safe, right, and healthy. And I think that for people who want to get into this field, and definitely there are a lot of universities offering like uh, food science programs. Usually the students have to go through at least four years of uh, undergraduate education and sometimes also graduate schools. Food science is a very interdisciplinary uh, subject field. So uh, you would need to have a good background in mathematics, uh, in like uh, chemistry, uh, maybe a little bit of physics, biology for sure. To get into the food industry, it's also very common for students to do an internship uh, in a food industry and, and uh, to get some work experiences uh, before they find their job. Yeah, in certain industries, actually, uh, there is uh, also apprenticeship, like uh, for flavor industry. They have a seven-year apprenticeship. You have to shadow a certified flavor chemist uh, before you can become one. Yeah, so that's kind of a long process. Yeah, wow, but I had no idea not that. not in all subject areas within food science requires that long of a yeah apprenticeship. Wow, I, I'm yeah. sure for things like chocolate, definitely it's a long process. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Why did I, I immediately picture like Willy Wonka too? <laughs> like it was such, <laughs> I, my immediate thought was like, well, you got to get you know those chocolates just right. <laughs> yeah, but actually now we have these uh, chocolate tempering machines. 
basically just put your raw ingredient in there. They will do everything. It's precisely controlled to achieve that uh, final nice texture, the gloss, the right melting point. Yeah. So you don't have, I mean, of course, if you like do the craft chocolate by hand, that requires a lot of skill, right? Uh, but actually like the science has made everything easy. Well, do you have a favorite Star Wars character? Yeah, I guess I'm I'm more into those uh, like different looking aliens. Like Yoda is definitely one of my uh, favorite, I think. Yeah, so that's why I also like the Mandalorian. That baby Yoda is so cute. Yeah. Uh, Grogu, yeah. The Grogu, yeah. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about the blue macarons, the, like, the little blue cookies that he's eating. Oh, when he's I mean, in class those are actually <laughs> common here, right? They dye macarons into all kinds of colors. So yeah. Yeah, that's something I I don't think looks alien to me. (laughs) (laughs) But it did look like blue raspberry to me, honestly. I I think those actually you can buy those macarons from the company that they sourced the macarons from. Okay, of course. But uh, I don't know what flavors are those. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Maybe raspberry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if Grogu for Grogu were they that krill color, right? Because it was or oh, that yeah. krill flavor, because it was after he was on that planet. Yeah, he was also eating <laughs> frogs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think we talked about that with uh with one of our earlier scientists, uh yeah, the right. ecologist, right? Where the, the yeah, eating the frogs but spitting yeah. out the ones that had the blue coloring on them because maybe they um, were poisonous. So but but now we know it's a structural color. Right. <laughs> there you go. So he could have eaten it. <laughs> well, uh, do you have any upcoming publications or uh, can people find you on social media? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really into the food current field. I do teach food current like in my food chemistry course. But yeah, we do have uh, some other publications coming up all the time. I have a, a Twitter, like some other social medias, but I have to admit that I haven't, ha- haven't been well maintained or updated yeah yeah if you have a like a sdsu webpage or something like that yeah, with yeah, your science and, yeah. and stuff and like I that also link to my google scholar so you can find all my publications uh, listed okay. there yeah okay. okay we'll make sure to put that in the show notes then well thank well, you so much for joining us this was a really fun discussion and i loved how much we talked about science and how much we talked about silly things like blue raspberries yeah, yeah. I think that's interesting. I think I probably will use that as examples uh, in my class. Yeah, now I know it. This is definitely a fun discussion. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our guest, Chong Chi Liu, and we want to thank all of you for listening. Are you looking for the links we talked about? Check out our show notes page available at skywalkingthroughneverland.com slash star dash warsologies. Check out our Star Wars Ologies YouTube channel where we post some episodes with related visuals from Star Wars. If you have an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or know an expert we should interview, let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at Star Wars Ologies at gmail.com. That's S T A R W A R S O L O G I E S. We also have a fan group on Facebook. It's called the Star Wars Ologies Podcast Fan Group. That's pretty easy to figure out. So join today and chat with us and your fellow listeners. Uh, we especially love your feedback from episodes. Yes, and we're always happy to keep answering questions because James and I always think about these things. Uh, And while you're at it, please rate, review, subscribe to our podcast on your favorite service and share it with your friends. In fact, I'm going to give you guys a bit of homework here. Please share it with at least two friends uh, before our next episode. No topic is off limits, even wondering if the ghost shuttle, the Phantom, is the real Phantom Menace. We're part of the Skywalking Network, where you can also find a variety of other great shows about Star Wars, Disney, and Marvel, including Talking Apes, The Neverland Clubhouse, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. They also have a YouTube show, Today in Star Wars History. You can find all of that at skywalkingnetwork.com. See you next time on Star Wars Ologies. So it sounds like (laughs) these crustaceans and and horseshoe crabs, they're very depressed and they're blue beforehand, but when you cook them, it's over. That's a good explanation. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I would be bummed too if somebody caught me to eat me. So.